right, so here's William Paul Young's story. We're going to call him Paul because that's what he goes by. Uh, Paul was born in Alberta, raised by missionary parents in New Guinea. Did not have the easiest upbringing. In fact, he was abused as a child. In his adult life, he ended up cheating on his wife. The relevance to this story is this. It was that situation that led Paul to reconnect to his Christian faith, which ultimately led to the writing of the book, The Shack. When he wrote The Shack, Paul was a working man in Oregon, only had a few copies printed. The idea was just given to his kids and a few friends, but when they read it, they loved it, and they were the ones who convinced Paul to try to get his book published. We printed off 15 copies, little spiral bound thing with a little plastic cover on it. The only problem was, well, he had a brick wall. 26 publishers turned that manuscript down, but Paul and his friends did not stop. So 2007, they spent $300 of their own money on advertising. They started shipping copies of the books out of his garage. Suddenly, through bloggers and church groups, word got out about the shack. And just over a year later, that thing went number one. Now, of course, anytime you write a book about God, there's bound to be controversy. Some preachers have denounced the book. How many of you have read the book, The Shack? Okay. If you haven't, don't. They say that it twisted the message of the Bible, calling The Shack deeply subversive and dangerous. The book itself reads like a thriller, so it's not your typical Bible story, right? You got a serial killer, you got a murdered child, and a creepy shack in the wilderness. Oh, the Lord does appear, but the Lord isn't some white dude in white beard with white robes, no. Paul made God an African-American woman named Papa to shake up religious preconceptions. Paul Young, everyone. How are you? Nice to see you. You all right? Things are good. You know, for a guy who wrote a book for his kids and a couple of friends, you know, what a long, strange trip it's been. Oh, that's, it's a God thing. There's no other way to look at it. It's, uh, it's a bona fide phenomenon. And I just wrote it, I have six children, my youngest is almost 16, so it's not like a children's story. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just trying to get it done by Christmas. Right. So the first and only intended run was 15 copies at Office Depot, a little after Christmas, 2005. I mean, for you, at the essence uh, of the story, like what is this story for you? Well, it's, it's um, suspense fiction wrapped around a what if. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm writing it for my kids, and so it's, 50 years being a religious kid, missionary kid, preacher's kid. Um, so who is this God really mm -hmm. after 50 years? So the what if part is, what if there's a God who has great affection for us? Right. Who will show up in the middle of our stuff? Uh, how would that change things? Who won't just show up, but who will challenge you? Absolutely. Who will force you to come to terms with not only who you are to them, but who yeah. you are to you? Absolutely. That's a tough question to answer. D did you know the answer to that question when you started <laughs> writing this book? Well, I knew I had an audience who would love me regardless. Right. Yeah. So that was the easy part. The, um, yeah, Mackenzie's weekend in the shack that he spends in the yeah, shack. Yeah, Mac is the guy yeah. who's the, the lead character of the book, essentially. Right. And uh, that weekend represents 11 years of my life. Right. So. How so? Um, you know, a lot of us have great sadnesses and great tragedies. Me, I'm a missionary kid, preacher's kid, grew up in a religious environment. And, uh, and I really tried to please God through all the religious efforts, you know. Mm -hmm. You try to pray enough and give enough and memorize enough and uh, be involved enough and, and uh, it never healed the damage inside. I use the shack as a metaphor. Mm -hmm. it stands for the heart of a human being, you know. That's what gets hurt on the inside and the dreams get broken and, and uh, people help you build the shack on the inside. Mm -hmm. And uh, mine had a, a lot of abuse and, and violence in it as a child. So I became a performer. You know, you set up your little facade on the outside and you play to whoever the audience is. Right. And you're living from the outside in because you got nothing on the inside that you feel is of any value. Sort of and, nothing uh, on the inside that you're going to let out. No. Uh, you don't want anybody in. That's why we hold secrets, right? right? Because we're afraid if we actually told them that we'd be rejected. But the flip side is when we try to earn their affection and approval and we get it, we don't believe it because they don't know we have the secret. Right. See? So we're caught in this in this jam. So 11 years of my facade being blown up and trying to reconstruct my life, find out who is this God really? And finding out that a lot of it was different than the way I grew up. I wonder what it is about you or your personality. Now, what, does it go beyond your upbringing that would make you have to figure out who this God is? Because for a lot of people, their question wouldn't be, who is this God? Their question would be, there is no God, so now I'm going to move on to something else. What is it my life's about? Why, for you, was it important to hang on to the idea of a God? I think because 
relationship is important to me. And that's why, you know, where I've settled is really with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, regardless of how I used imagery for them. Do you believe that the three are one again? Because that confuses ah, a lot of atheists. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, but the beauty of it, <laughs> it's new math, yeah. right? <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> Paul, your math is weird, but go with it. Yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. If it works for you. Yeah, totally. Yes. And uh, so, you know, um, to me, the fact that there is relationship within the very nature and character of God validates relationship, period. Mm -hmm. Or love. And I think that's really significant. But I'm not, I'm sure you've, you've heard this lots. Your version of God is not perhaps the version of God that you were taught as a kid. Well, I think that's true, but none of us believes exactly what we did 10 years ago. Right. Hopefully. Well, hopefully. Hopefully we've evolved as people, right? Yeah, I hope so. But yeah. 10 years ago, we thought we had it all together, right? right. So, you Not know. Me. <laughs> <laughs> Last week, though, you thought you did. Yeah, well, yeah. geez, let me tell you, Paul. Those days are long ago. Yeah. But anyway. So a different, yeah. different God, you know, and uh, a lot of us grew up, especially within the religious context of the, the monster God performer requirer, you know. Right. And uh, so it was all about trying to please God. And it really doesn't matter in any religion um, who the God is. You just have to know what the rules are. Right. So it's five pillars in one religion, seven steps in another, a million four hundred and thirty-three thousand four hundred thirteen rules in the other one right. you know, that I grew up in. Is that the Scientologist one? No, it's okay. a Protestant <laughs> evangelicalism. Yeah. Well, Close. The, but you see, your version of the God that I got in this book was not the God of the rules. No. It, was less, it, it seemed to be less about a structure. Well, rules won't heal you. No, but rules can... Well, I suppose the reason for rules is that they feel some people need a sense and want a sense of community. Well, and, it also and, and gives you power. power. Yeah. And it also gives you a way to judge other people that aren't as good at it That's as the you. word. Your God in this book isn't a judging God. In most other religions, it appears to be a judging God yeah. in the organized context. Was that a key distinction for you? Uh, I think so. And judging in what sense? It's not that this God isn't in your face about all the stuff that you're hurting yourself and others with, mm -hmm. which God is. Uh, but this is a God who fundamentally loves and that everything that God does is a manifestation of that love. Uh, anybody who is, you're a Christian, right? You tell me what one is and I'll tell you if I'm one of those. Right. You know, I, I'm a Canadian, not a Republican. Right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> right. You know, but that's a big part of it. I think you found over the last, you know, the first six years of the George Bush administration when they were so God-centric and it was all about the, you know, the, the yeah. religious base. And also, he had a God who he said told him to go to war, which was some Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar shit that people went, what? Yeah. What do you mean? And that through, there's a whole generation of people who reject any kind of organized religion based on those who practice it. Well, yeah, absolutely, and with good reason. You know, just because people practice something doesn't, either validate or invalidate what they actually say they believe. Right. And it's just like Gandhi saying, you know, I, I love your Jesus, it's not the Christians I'm wild about. <laughs> you know, and, uh, yeah, it's not the band I hate, it's the fans. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the book, and I've gotten a little bit of heat for this, Jesus says to Mackenzie, he says, you know, I didn't come to make people Christians, I'm not one. Yeah. Right? And he's not. He was born a Jew, raised a Jew, died a Jew, rose from the dead a Jew. Mm -hmm. And he, he didn't like 30 years later go, if I'd have just waited, I could have become a Christian, right. you know? I could have been. <laughs> but when you, when you tackle that idea of God, obviously, but it does come from a Christian, a, a fundamental Christian base for you. Well, it comes from the biblical representation. It comes really from the person of Jesus. But Everything. It, but it's not the Bible per se, right? Because you have taken from the Bible and sort of made your version of it. Well, I would, I would disagree. I'd say that what I presented is quite orthodox, even though I get slammed as being very unorthodox. I think we just don't know how to read the Bible except through our paradigms of self-centeredness and yeah. power and all those kinds of things. So we don't hear the story of love that's there. Religion is very patriarchal. You went right out the other way. You made God a black woman. Yeah. Which, and I actually think that the, one of the big reasons you got so much criticism is because of that. And people may, may not, the critics may not publicly say they had a problem with it, but that is a problem for a lot of people. Yeah, because it's, you can't really say... What are you going to choose, because, it's, because she's black or because she's a woman? Yeah. I mean, that's going to be a problem. And, and he, even in orthodoxy, God is not male or female. He's not even like 51% male and 49% female. Mm -hmm. you know? God is spirit. So all of maleness, all of femaleness are both derived out of the nature and character of God. And uh, so I use imagery, and imagery is always going to be inadequate at some point, because we're not dealing with really a God who is just a huge human being. We're dealing with a very different character in nature, one that is fundamentally different because of love, because of grace, because of forgiveness, because of those things. To you, is the Bible the unfettered word of God? 
I think Jesus is the unfettered Word of God. But the Bible is often taught and is held up as this is the Word of God, this is, this is God's here, message. Here's the problem with the statement. You're mostly dealing with people's interpretation of those, right. of those words. And so, you know, they can say that all they want, but what they mean is how they interpret it themselves. But for you, when you is the Bible your call, is that, what you, you, is that the foundation for which you build your house upon? Is it the Bible or is it something else? Oh, it's definitely more the Bible, but it's even more than that. It's the, the living person of who Jesus is. Way more than that. Jesus is the Word. As you interpret the Word. Sure, yeah. in terms of relationship, absolutely. And, but I, but scriptures definitely put parameters on that, too. And, uh, and so that plays a part in my, in my life, personally. Did you expect the... Because there, there are a lot of people who are very much in favor of your book, and there are a lot who criticize. Yeah. Uh, we can, I don't really want to focus on those who criticize, because I'm sure you expected to be criticized by the Pharisees. I thought it'd day. be a lot more. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. What I'm curious about, and I'm sure you've met them, and I've met a lot of them throughout the show or whatever, it's the progressive pastor. There's this new age of pastor that doesn't get on television, right? Yeah. The kind of wild, crazy pastor of yesteryear, they're, they're, they're not the ones that, that, you know, that, that really reach, I think, a lot of young people. There's this new kind of pastor. The neo-pastor. Have you met them? Like, what do yes. they think about what you do? They love it. And, and it's because they see it as a bridge into relationship, not into religion. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that is such a central point, is that this is not an invitation to a new religion that's comparing and competing with all the others. Mm -hmm. This is into a relationship of a God who is actively involved in my life, but who has a respect for his creation, is not going to just absolutely stop us from doing the things that damage each other and hurt each other. We all have pain and great sadness. But these are fundamental questions. We all want, want to be authentic people, too. How do we get there? Mm -hmm. and, and what's the basis to even be authentic or to be forgiving or to be loving? Pain and great sadness, yeah. which is part of the reason that you wrote this book. Absolutely. Right. I don't know if you even believe in closure at all, but did you find it? Like, did you, did you get an answer out of this? Well, you have to understand that my 11 years was effectively the closure for me. Mm -hmm. I didn't write this book as part of the healing process. I wrote the book because of the healing process. You know, I found that God was totally different than I grew up with. Uh, and one of the ways I say is that it took me 50 years to wipe the face of my father off the face of God. Right? That's and a, a lot of us thing to do, man. Oh, man. A lot of us know that. Because yeah. either the father was absent or the father was violent or whatever. And... Um, and we just transpose that onto the character and nature of God. So in a world of uncertainty, what, where do we plant certainty? Mm -hmm. And if it's not in the character of God, that he's good all the time, and that God is involved in the details of our lives and loves us, especially fond of us, each one of us. It's you, a, for example. Well, well I, you know. let's, let's not open up that drawer, okay, buddy? Let's not go into that shack. Uh, Please come back. There's a lot more I want to talk to you about this, but we're out of time. It's good I to see you. I would love to do that. Paul Young, everybody. Hey, bless you. Thank you. Paul Young, Paul Young. The Shack. All right. This is actually going to sound a bit weird. We're going to go from the Shack to the track. Mike Landretti right after this.